Hey, what happens when a person just chooses to defy God and reject him as God, reject his salvation, reject his truth? Do they cease to exist? Are there other outcomes that we need to take seriously? We're going to wrestle with some big questions today. I'm glad you've joined me on the Growing in the Gospel YouTube channel. I'm Kerry. I privilege, I'm privileged to pastor just one of the most wonderful church families in all the world, Emmanuel Baptist Church of Newington, Connecticut. But more than anything, I'm just a guy that loves God, loves Jesus, loves his word, loves his people. I'm a growing follower of Jesus. We live in more and more confusing and chaotic and tumultuous times. And so for 10 to 15 minutes, and this week more, I'm sorry, um, I've gone over time this week, 10 to 15 minutes a day, we, we, we take some time on growing in the gospel to unpack God's word. Right now we're slow walking through Psalms. The other thing we do on this channel is more long form teaching. And I'm very excited that we've now uploaded all the Dunn series. So that's on its own playlist, the entire Dunn book, Presentation of Salvation in the Gospel. We're starting something exciting today. It's a seven-part teaching series. Later today, I'm going to schedule that video to be made available at about 2 p.m. It's the series called The Big Picture. We're going to understand the overarching narrative of God's Word. So if you have questions about how do you understand the Bible, and what about when you drop into Judges or Genesis or First or Second Chronicles or Malachi or Isaiah, where are you when you drop into those books? What's going on? Who's talking? Who's writing? What's it about? Uh, what about when you jump into the New Testament, the, the, you know, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or Romans, or uh, the, the epistles, or Revelation? Um, how can you, we're going to equip you to come at the Bible in its entirety, and no matter where you're at in the narrative or in the scripture, you'll you kind of know where you are. You'll kind of have your bearings. You'll know uh, the trajectory of the message and the overarching theme of God's Word. So this is an immensely equipping series. It's why I chose it. Next to Don, the Salvation Principles, that is the first series to release. So look for that at about 2 o'clock today, and it's a seven-part series. It will be in its own playlist, and we'll build out that series over the next week or two. So I hope you'll take the journey. It is a longer-form teaching, so those videos will be 40 to 50, 55 minutes, probably something like that. We're in Psalm 83 on our daily devotional journey, and today we're picking it up in about verse 13. So let me give you a little of the backstory, and many of you have been taking the journey. If you're new to the channel, I hope you'll subscribe and hope you'll, uh, more than that, drop a comment and continue taking the journey with us as we grow together in the gospel. But this is a, a psalm that's a prayer. The psalmist begins in verses 1 and 2 by saying, God, we need you to, to speak up and to step in and to be active in a desperate situation. Your enemies, your enemies, that's important are rising up against your people. That's also important. They want to wipe us off the face of the earth, ceasing us, uh, stopping us from being a nation. That's verse 4. They've consulted together. And then we break down the nations, verses 6, 7, 8. And we basically understand that it's all the nations surrounding present-day Israel. So in that sense, this psalm is likely historical and likely prophetic at the same time, okay? Uh, historical in that these have always been the enemies of God's people. Uh, historical in that and prophetic in that these enemies were confederate together in the Six-Day War in the late 1960s. And prophetic in the sense that these are still basically the nations that are stacked up against Israel and every day speaking negatively about wiping them off the face of the earth and tensions continue to grow and mount and we're living in very volatile times, which if you're a believer in God's word and in Jesus, these are hopeful times as well, because we see the signs of the times. We see everything lining up for end time prophecy. And if you're not a believer, you need to look at Bible prophecy because uh, it's extremely convincing. The Bible is 100% accurate in its prophetic uh, predictions. And so there's no reason to doubt that it wouldn't all fall into place just the way God said it would. And now is the time, and we're going to talk about this more in a second, now is the time to turn to Jesus, to receive him and to know him and to walk with him, to trust his word and his promises, because there's going to be a lot of deception and a lot of destruction and accountability for those that reject the, the evident revealed mercy and grace of God that's been available to us all of our lives. Uh, so it's time to stop rejecting and resisting. And it's time to bow and receive 
him as Lord and Savior. So we pick it up. Now, yesterday we talked about the Midianites and Sisera and Jabin and Kishon and Endor and all these locations and these stories from the book of Judges, Judges 4, Judges 7, and 8. And now we come to verse 13, 14, and 15. Oh, my God, make them like a wheel. So this prayer for these enemies is that God would intervene and bring judgment and vengeance. And we left off yesterday explaining that this is the safe prayer that we put judgment in the hands of God. We put uh, restitution. We put vengeance. We put ultimate destruction, if that's the end, in the hands of God. That is his trigger to pull. That is his uh, role to fill, okay? So the psalmist says, oh my God, I just love the personal nature of that. This psalmist is absolutely secure in God, though he's surrounded by enemies. Let that sink in for a minute. Personally, okay, when you're surrounded by a world of hatred and bitterness and scorn for your faith, you can still say, I am one of his hidden ones, verse 2. He is my God. I have a father and a shepherd and a guide and a protector and a savior, and he's mine. And I am his. And I don't know where this video finds you today, what you're facing, but catch your breath for a minute. That's why we do this. Just just catch your breath. I have a God. He's my God. And I'm his child. And he's bigger than my problems. And he's not worried about my problems. And I can talk to him about my problems and he understands them and he's already around the next corner. He already knows he's going to go before me and make the crooked places straight. He's going to walk with me and provide for me. He's going to get me home. He's going to get me all the way home so I can hold on to him and follow him. My friend, you have a good God. You have a good savior in Jesus. Don't let the world lie to you and don't believe the bad rap that God gets. He's wonderful. And knowing him, there's just nothing better than knowing him. So the psalmist says, oh my God, isn't that the first, by the way, the, per, the person that rejects God, when things go down, I mean, when they really go down in that person's life, what's their first words? Oh my God. And usually we see that as kind of like taking God's name in vain. It's just almost flippant. But, uh, but that's, that's the cry of our hearts. It's instinctive. It's kind of woven in us. We need a God. So then the prayer unfolds, make them like a wheel as the stubble before the wind, as the fire burneth a wood, and as the flame sets the mountains on fire. So persecute them with thy tempest. The word persecute them is pursue, run after, chase, put them to flight, chase them away, hunt them down. Um, Persecute them with thy tempest and make them afraid with thy tempest. Storms. We're going to pause at the end of verse 15. Three verses today. Oh my God, make them like the wheel. Let's talk about the the the, the meanings of these words. The wheel. It's referring to a like a like a uh, sagebrush, like a tumbleweed. For 22 years, I lived in the desert, the high desert of Southern California, out near Edwards Air Force Base, what's called the Antelope Valley. And in that valley, there are tumbleweeds galore. It's, it's like New England's version of, of blizzards, okay? It's, just, it's the plague of living in the desert. And these, these weeds, they grow really big and round, and, and they're green when they're rooted. But the root is not very deep. And, it, and when in the dry seasons, which is all the time generally, the, the green doesn't last very long. It doesn't take much for the bush to dry out. And then the wind is always whipping through the desert. And so it just it just detaches these tumbleweeds from its real fragile uh, root and they begin to blow like a wheel tumbling across the desert and that's the the sense of this make them like a wheel as the stubble before the wind and can i just press into that for a minute and say um, first of all that god's enemies all over the planet are big and blustering and they look mighty and strong like these tumbleweeds do they look like trees and they're you know i've seen tumbleweeds the size of a volkswagen um, but they're utterly fragile. They're, there's no root. Uh, they're incredibly vulnerable. Uh, they're shallow. And as soon as the little bit of water is gone, they dry right up. They become brittle. Uh, they, they break off of their roots. They tumble away. 
And then uh, you've, you've probably seen the news of California brush fires. Well, if you live way out in the desert, we don't, we don't get those as much in the desert because there's not a lot of trees in the desert. Um, and those, those brush fires happen mostly in the mountains. Um, where I lived, you could see them all around you every season. You could see the smoke. In fact, we would get the fallout from, uh, from the, the, uh, the mountain fires, you know, the, the forest fires. It, the ash would fall onto our cars and our houses and our yards. Um, and the, the air quality was, was pretty bad for many weeks at a time. So the, the tumbleweeds, they, they're very uh, flammable, though. If, if you did pile them up, we would often rake them into piles and set them on fire, you know, because that was the best thing to do with them. Uh, they're really not good for much. So make them like stubble before the wind. Blow them away, God. Um, that, the idea of making them weak, they're, they're weaker. God's enemies are weaker than they appear. And by the way, that's true personally in your life. When you're surrounded by problems or challenges or enemies or scorn or hatred or persecution of any kind, you can understand that that is a weak and flimsy. It's a blustering. It's a giant uh, intimidating thing, but it's, it's just push right through it. It's, it's like, it's an, it's a mirage, a little bit of tweaking and it's going to break away from its branch and it's going to dry up and tumble away. And it's going to be driven away by the smallest of winds. Verse 14, as the fire burns a wood, And as the flame sets the mountains on fire, so drive them with thy tempest. So God, blow, blow on the enemies and drive them away, chase them away like a consuming fire, just just consuming the the, the mountainsides and blowing. And again, I I refer to my time in California, those those mountain fires, it would, they could just run right up a mountainside and right down a mountainside because the wind gave them such... Uh, rapid spread and they could jump freeways. I mean, it was amazing how that fire could, could, could flow. And that's the picture that the psalmist is bringing. It, it reminds me of the verse, our God is a consuming fire. So the psalmist is praying for God's final vindication and final and ultimate judgment on the enemies, not just personal enemies, but on the enemies of God. So the psalmist is really praying a rhetorical prayer claiming the promises that God has already made, that he will come and bring ultimate vengeance and judgment on that which is evil and that which has declared itself to be his enemy. Now, how do we reconcile a God of wrath and a God of love? Well, the same way you reconcile a loving dad who would become a wrathful father if anything threatened his children or his wife. So you take a dad who is in a setting where his children are being assaulted, and that dad, if he truly loves passionately his children, he is going to intervene with fiery indignation and holy righteous wrath and rescue his family from the oppression, from the murder, from the bloodshed of enemies. So God is a righteous judge. And so there is evil. There are enemies who have wholly sold themselves, mostly spiritual and then human as well, mostly sold themselves against God in an unrepentant unbelief. Now, now, right now, is because God hasn't brought that fiery final ultimate judgment, we call this the age of grace or the age of mercy. It means that everybody can turn and receive God's gift of grace and love and mercy because he is loving. But one day... His mercy, the door, the opportunity of mercy will close and he will bring judgment, righteous, fair, equitable judgment on that which has declared itself to be the ardent, unrepentant, permanent, unconvincible enemy of God himself. He can't negotiate forever with his enemies. He won't let evil and wickedness go on forever. Otherwise, he wouldn't be good. He would be complicit with evil. No, he will rectify. He will restore and bring final and ultimate judgment. That's why you don't want a God that isn't wrathful. You don't want a God that doesn't have a righteous indignation. You don't even want a God that doesn't have a place called hell or a lake of fire where he will lock away evil forever. He can't just call it into non-existence. That would be uh, impossible in the sense that evil exists because goodness exists. It's It's a default existence, like darkness exists because light exists, okay? 
Um, and so rather than calling everything into non-existence, God will lock away darkness and build a kingdom of perpetual light and goodness forever and ever. So that locker, that lock away, that prison, we understand justice. We have a prison system. We have the death penalty. We understand quarantine. If someone is toxic, we, we quarantine them. So God is, gonna, is good and he's just and he's loving and he's going to quarantine sin and death and wickedness and evil forever and ever and ever. He's going to triumph over it and quarantine it in a quarantine that is inescapable. And, uh, and that will allow for a perfect eternity and a good eternity uh, that we can look forward to. Now, the question is, will he save you? Will you enter eternity saved or will he judge you? And that hinges on what you do with Jesus because Jesus on the cross bore your judgment. So if you receive Jesus, you don't have to fear judgment or wrath because Jesus took it for you. It, he took the blow. He, uh, he went to the electric chair for you. So you can live in love and grace and mercy forever and ever and ever because your sins are atoned for by Jesus. Jesus paid for your crimes. That's what we call the good news of God. That is the announcement of all of the Bible. And the thing that we, now ancient Israel holds on to this promise and, and modern Israel to some degree in the sense that it's prophetic maybe, um, holds on to these promises that God's going to intervene and deliver them from their enemies like he has many, many times. But the bigger kind of 30,000 foot view that really applies to our lives personally is that God is a righteous vengeance God. He will rectify things. He, he, he won't just sit on his hands forever and ever and ever when it comes to the existence of evil and bad things. So we do pray for God to bring, to consummate his kingdom and to consummate judgment. But, but until then, we pray for the repentance and the rescue of as many as possible. Um, the local church is like a big lifeboat uh, bringing in as many people to repentance and to faith in Jesus Christ so they can be rescued from coming judgment. So friend, if you've never trusted Christ, you need to, you need to, you'll never regret making Jesus your savior. And it's a free gift when you receive it by faith right now, you can do that. And if you have, then you can take hope at the, at the news stream. You can take hope at the modern state of political and geopolitical events. You can take hope at the enemies in your own life and at that surround your own personal world that God uh, will ultimately triumph. So, um, and so we press forward again to, uh, well, on Monday for uh, the final part of Psalm 83. I am enjoying this, uh, this study together. I hope it's encouraging you every step of the way. It's been powerful in my life and I pray so in yours. Be sure to drop a comment or a question I'm loving interacting with you. I'm loving the growing community that God is building here at Growing in the Gospel. Don't forget that uh, later today we begin the long-form teaching series, part one of God's Big Picture. So enjoy that. Have a great weekend, and I will see you in the next video.